day talking about the groundwork. We'll be talking about uh, the third section. On Wednesday and Friday, we'll talk a little bit about the metaphysics of morals. So on um, Wednesday, we'll talk about um, sort of the overview of the doctrine of right. And then on Friday, we'll get a kind of overview of the doctrine of virtue. So these are Kant's more mature works on um, morality. And then on Monday, we'll start talking about ancient uh, the genealogy of morality. Uh, you won't have any reading for the first mm, at least one, maybe two days. Um, so we'll talk about that on Monday. Also, Monday, your papers are good. Um, so I've heard from mm, some, but not all of you, about topics. You need to get those to me, get them approved. The papers do it. Okay, so section one, first section of the groundwork, uh, we were supposed to be working from our ordinary common sense understanding of value and morality. We were reflecting on what is good and what is unconditionally good, what is the condition for conditionally good things being good, that led us to think about the special kind of goodness that a morally good person has, uh, the special kind of value associated with duty, and we're supposed to be analyzing that intuitive uh, idea to get to, eventually, the supreme principle of morality. So we were supposed to conclude that if, so it's a conditional, if, our ordinary moral sense is correct, if our ordinary understanding of value is correct, then the categorical imperative of the supreme principle of morality is correct also. In section two then, we were supposed to be working from the idea of a rational will, or more specifically, the idea of a rational will that is imperfect since, since it's subject to empirical limitations, like a will like ours. And we were supposed to then work from that to identify, or well, first to contrast the idea of a hypothetical imperative with the categorical imperative. And then we saw the idea of the categorical imperative in uh, its various formulations. So we could conclude from part two that if we have a free will, if we have the capacity to will rationally, then the categorical imperative applies to us. Um, and in both of those sections, Kant says we proceeded, as it were, analytically, simply teasing out the ideas that were already implicit in what we started from, either our understanding of value or our idea of so finally, in this section now, we're looking to see what kind of case can be made for the existence of a free will, and therefore a vindication of the claim that we, we, you and I, are in fact bound by this categorical narrative. Um, and before I start, uh, I want to just point out that this last section is um, controversial. Um, there's a lot of disagreement in the liter literature about what Kant uh, is trying to establish and how he tries to go about doing so and whether he succeeds. And also I'll point out that um, the relationship between this section and the second critique published just a few years later practical reason, that also is controversial. Um, and it seems as though Kant uh, changes his mind about exactly what can be established in that. Okay. So let's look at uh, the third section, right at the beginning. He starts out by saying, a will, starts out by saying, a will is a kind of causality of living thing, of living beings, insofar as they are rational. 
And freedom would be that property of such a causality as it can be efficient independently of alien causes determining it. Just as natural necessity is the property of the causality of all non-rational beings to be determined to activity by the influence of alien causes. Okay, so first of all, we need to be careful with this phrase insofar as they are rational. Um, because Kant had better not mean that um, it's a kind of causality that occurs only on those occasions when that kind of being is rational. Right? It better not mean, better not mean that, um, better not mean that the will is active, so to speak, only when it's acting rationally. Because this is what we talked about last time. It better mean something like insofar as we have the capacity to act on the basis of um, reasons. Uh, insofar as practical reasons apply to us, the will is a form of causality. Because if we only, so to speak, had a will on those occasions when we acted rationally, um, we would not have a will, or maybe we wouldn't be exercising it, whenever we made irrational or unreasonable decisions. And that would be bad because uh, morality for Kant amounts to acting on practical reasons. And so if that were the case, that we only had a will when we acted rationally or reasonably, um, then, then on those occasions when we did act irrationally or unreasonably, we would be acting without freedom. Um, so uh, if all of our immoral or unreasonable or irrational actions were done without freedom, uh, it um, makes it impossible to see how somebody could be responsible for acting badly. And the whole problem here, this is what I talked about this last time, the whole problem can be avoided if we read this passage instead of saying that we have free will in light of our capacity to act on the basis of reasons. And we still do have this capacity when it's not exercised, when we act irrationally, when we act unreasonably, when we act immorally, we still have the capacity to act properly. It's just that we don't. We use that capacity incorrectly um, when we act normally. OK, so um, this first passage is saying that um, insofar as we have the capacity to act on reasons, we have uh, freedom. And notice that this first sense of freedom that he's talking about here, um, it's the capacity to be efficient to cause events, independently of alien causes determining it. So this first understanding of freedom here is freedom to cause uh, events, freedom to cause objects independent of external determination. And so Kant says that this first understanding of freedom is negative. It's simply saying that uh, the will is not determined by anything outside of it. The explication of freedom stated above, he says, is negative, and therefore it's unfruitful for gaining insight into its essence, into the idea of what a free will is. So far, this just says that it's something not determined by outside causes, but itself is a cause. Itself is able to bring about ends. Is that clear? Okay. But, he says, there flows from this negative definition a positive concept of freedom, uh, which is so much the richer and more fruitful. Okay, 
So somehow we need to get out from this negative initial definition of freedom some kind of positive